Good afternoon. It being 5:04, uh, we'll call this June second meeting of the uh, Public Safety Committee to order. And I am chair of the committee, uh, Maureen Carney, uh, city councilor, and with us today two members of the committee: Councilor Bill Dwight, Councilor David Murphy, Councilor Jesse Adams, and Council Clerk Pam Powers. And um, I will announce that this meeting is being audio and video recorded. And ask if there is any public comment this afternoon. Seeing none, I ask for approval of the minutes. Um, I move that we accept the minutes from the last meeting. Second. Any additions, corrections, or otherwise? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Uh, meetings are approved. And with us today, we have a report of the health department. So I will actually ask, uh, if you don't mind, um, when you, actually, you could join us at the table if it's easier. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Okay. For the, for the public, though, you could just uh, identify yourself. Okay. Sure. Sure. Meredith O'Leary, I'm the public health director for the city of Northampton. And thank you for inviting me here today to speak. I don't so much have a report for you as I do just a small presentation tonight on some of the things that we're seeing in the health department in terms of infectious disease, both emerging and re-emerging. I'm only going to take a small portion of your time tonight, considering it's so nice outside, I'm sure. <laughs> there are other places that everybody would like to be. But with that being said, we'll just move into it. Um, so tonight I'm just going to give you a, a a snapshot of some of the uh, emerging and re-emerging diseases that pose a threat to the public and I'm going to talk about a little bit about their uh, definitions, factors contributing to the emergence, examples of some of these diseases, and the public health role, the role that we play here in the health department. So first of all, before we get into that, I just want to briefly describe what an infectious disease is. An infectious disease is caused by microorganisms or it's, po or it's poisonous byproducts and they have potential for um, serious illnesses, deaths, and they can happen, they can have uh, epidemic or pandemic proportions. Infectious disease, diseases have plagued humans throughout history. In fact, they've even shaped history on some occasions. Uh, we have the bubonic plagues of biblical times. We have Black Death of the Middle Ages, and then we've had the Spanish flu pandemic in 1918, and then recently we just had the swine flu in 2009. Probably all re uh, remember that. So infectious disease pose a threat regardless of age, gender, lifestyle, ethnic background, socioeconomic status. They cause suffering, they cause death, they impose a financial burden on society. The good news is, though, that through the advent of good sanitation, antibiotics, vaccination, over the past century, deaths from infectious disease have declined significantly. However, the bad news is, over the past 20 years or so, there's been an increase of emerging disease and re-emerging older diseases, um, with a significant rise in the past decade itself. So there's been an increase, a trend, in, uh, a trend or an uptick in disease, infectious disease, over the past 20 years, and then a significant rise, then again, in the past 10 years. And here, um, unfortunately, I couldn't find a better graph that depicted from the, you know, the late 90s to 2014, but you can see going back to the 1900s, um, the incident rates of infectious disease, these are death rates, mortality, morbidity rates, um, and then you see that there was chlorine in municipal water, and kind of like the timeline, you can see it going down, and then you had the Spanish influenza in 1918 where it spiked again, and then we had a de decrease, and it's been slowly, slowly, slowly declining. But then right there on the tail towards the uh, 2000, we're starting to see an increase again, and now you see more of a spike into 2014. So 
seems like there's a loose connection. Hopefully yeah, we'll get it's, through. It's, it's always a little inky. <laughs> awesome. Um, so when I talk about infectious disease, I use the words emerging and re-emerging. Re-emerging are infectious agents that have been known for some time. Um, they fall into such low number, numbers or levels that they were no longer considered a public health problem. And now they're showing upward trends again in incidence or prevalence. Some of these re-emerging diseases are measles, mumps, polio. We're seeing them now. We haven't seen them for 50 to 60 years because of vaccine. But again, there are contributing factors why there's a rise. And then we have our emerging infectious diseases. And these are newly identified um, unknown infectious agents that cause a public health problem. They can either be a local problem, an international problem, what have you. And things that are on the news right now that I'm sure you've heard of are SARS, MERS, Ebola, um, avian flu, swine flu. These are all emerging diseases. <clears throat> and right here is kind of a global map of emerging diseases. And again, because of the loose connection, it's not as bright as I want it to be for you, but it's kind of showing you what's where in the globe and what's going on. And this map is of 2014, so if I could have found an updated one, there would be more on there. But you can see in, our, in, in the U.S. we're dealing with Lyme, we're dealing with a lot of zoonotic diseases, arbovirus, West Nile virus, Tripoli, etc. So we show plague there in Africa? Is that yeah. the bubonic plague then? Or yes, the bubonic okay. plague is surged, yep. So why are we seeing emerging and re-emerging diseases? There's many contributing factors to that. Um, we have the evolution of pathogenic, uh, pathogenic infectious diseases. So we have a lot of these um, infectious diseases that have a virulent strain where um, the, the microbe can change and giving it structure where it can, can form a new strain and then you can cause, it can cause, you know, an epidemic or a pandemic. And what I'm trying to explain is we have these, all these different um, influenza types, not your basic influenza that we see here in the U.S. per se, but we have these strains, they're called type A strains, and these are strains, bird strains, pig strains, that typically just stay within those type of animals. They don't tend to jump from humans, but once in a while, it'll mutate and it'll jump. It's a virulent, virulent strain, a very strong strain. It'll mutate, it'll jump, it'll go to humans, and that's where we can have a real big problem. They're saying that the next great pandemic is either gonna be from, from a bird or from the swine flu. So. Just the example, just to get into popular culture, but the, so the film Contagion, Mm -hmm. Did you all see that? No. Okay. Well, it's kind of it very much that same exactly. example of a bat and a pig, right? Mm hmm mm hmm Yep, exactly. What it is. It's a great movie. It is um, scary. It is scary. Mm -hmm. mm hmm It's one of the um, better epidemiology movies that I watch. It's something that really could happen, very tangible. And what we're preparing for in my field, you know. Um, so, yes, exactly. Other contributing factors is we have the development of, of resistance to drugs with international travel due to tourism and trade. We have resistance to vectors and pesticides. And then we have human behavior also. We have food habits, things that are trending now, sexual practices, and vaccination exemptions. So, Vaccination. A vaccine is one of the most cost-effective and successful public health interventions ever. Um, vaccines have minimized or eliminated outbreaks of certain diseases that were once lethal to large numbers of people, including measles and polio right here in the U.S. Vaccines save about six to nine million lives annually worldwide. Vaccine, uh, vaccines have decreased vaccine-preventable diseases in children by more than 95%. That is huge. However, pathogens still exist, 
So the public health gains can only be mid, uh, maintained by ensuring that vaccine rates remain high enough to prevent outbreaks. So that's very important. We have to maintain this level of vaccination to keep these diseases at bay. Um, high vaccination rates not only protect those who receive the vaccine, but it also they also confer broader protection for the entire community, which they now kind of term as herd immunization. Okay, herd immunity. This is important because it decreases the likelihood of the disease to maintain a chain of infection when there's when there's herd immunity, because in some communities inevitably there are those who cannot receive a vaccine either because chronic medical illness, they're not old enough, you know, babies can't receive all of the vaccines that they need, and uh, then you have those that have religious exemptions. So maintaining herd immunity is very, very important. Strategic vaccination cam campaigns have virtually eliminated diseases that previously were common in the U.S. Um, in 1949, the pertussis vaccine program um, basically eliminated pertussis up to about 15, 20 years ago. 1955, we had the introduction of the polio vaccine. In 1962, uh, there was passage of the Vaccination Assistant Act, which uh, federal government supported vaccines and then became mandated. <clears throat> There are a list of vaccine preventable diseases, and these are just a, a snapshot of the vaccine preventable diseases. So vaccine preventable diseases is just what it says. There is a vaccine out there. If you get it and you maintain the proper dose within your body, you will not get the disease. And there's the mayor at one of our flu clinics that we hold. Every year we hold, um, we, we give about a thousand flu vaccines out. And this year we're going to be doing mobile vaccines to the lower income projects. We are we got our hands on a mobile trailer and we're going to use that and go out and get vaccines. So um, the rise of the anti-vaccination anti movement. This this is creating such a huge problem. We see vaccination rates falling because of a few reasons. Um, one is Andrew Wakefield. He, is, he was a, a doctor who claimed that the uh, vaccine, the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, um, there was a link between that and autism. He had a study of 12 British children, and all 12 British children came down with vax, uh, excuse me, autism on some spectrum um, after receiving the MMR vaccine. Subsequent studies um, failed to replicate his findings, and then the investigation, the final investigation, said that um, his, his whole study was based upon fraud. However, it came too late. These findings were way too late. This information was out there. It confused people, it made people doubt the MMR vaccine and other vaccines. So a lot of information had already been spread by the time it was retracted. And anyone who, who Googles, you know, vaccines and autism is automatically brought to these old reports saying that there's a link. So again, there's still lots of confusion out there. So it started a wave of apprehension and confusion that still continues to spread even to date. Um, in 2012, in some states, there's a 5 to 8 percent of parents who opted out of their children not having vaccines because of an exemption. You know, prior it was just um, a medical exemption where you can opt out of getting a vaccine, but now they've opened it up to religious exemptions, and you don't need anything to prove that you have a, a medical or a religious exemption. So that rate went extremely high. So 5 to 8 percent, where the national average is 2.7 percent. So that's where it was before the Wakefield reports, and this is where it is for many states after the Wakefield reports. Then we have the uh, anti-vaxxers. 
the, uh, let's see, the anti-vaxxers are those people who oppose vaccine because it's seen as unnatural. You know, there's this huge organic movement. They don't want anything with preservatives or not natural to the body. Um, they're people who distrust government. And then you have the religious conservatives who are very suspicious of science. So they call them the anti-vaxxers. And then the autism epidemic, again, this goes back to Andrew, Andrew Wakefield, but now we have famous people who are on the uh, autism uh, vaccine campaign publicly. They've written, Jenny McCarthy um, has written a book. She did, you know, television spots telling the people um, that her boy got autism after he received the MMR vaccine, and it, it just created this huge craze. So anyways, with that being said, we have a huge, I shouldn't say huge, but a significantly higher unvaccinated or un, uh, under-vaccinated rate. I apologize for such a small photo here, um, but this is Massachusetts, and these are our vaccination rates. It's time for an update. It's time for an update. <laughs> okay. So say 4.2%? 4.2 in Hampshire yeah. County. So again, with the national average being about 2% of the under or unvaccinated rate, here in Hampshire County, our percent, and these are just children, these are not adults, um, is 4.2%. And this is just these are public higher. school. Pardon me? The Cape is the highest. Yep. Yeah. And Franklin County is very high too, 6%. But everyone else falls within the national average rates. So that's alarming. How, how do you determine these stats? The State Department of Public Health. Okay, so they report them. on, yes. so for mm -hmm. infant, infant immunization. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. These yep. are kids in school. These are kids in school, oh. right. So yep. the 6% that's in Franklin County, that's, mm -hmm. that's really high. Yes, that it is. Do we just figure there's a lot of anti-vaxxers that are, or anything to attribute that high number? I, I couldn't even begin to guess why. Is it related to poverty? Because Franklin County is the yeah. poorest county, right? No, because usually no. our lower income families are up to date on their vaccination. Oh. So it's conversely to that. It's mm -hmm. yeah. done through the school. So then the school program is a state-run program and a federal program, right, for immunization? So, right. right. So they say, you know, by five years of age, you need to have X, Y, and Z vaccines unless you have an exemption. And again, because you don't have to prove that exemption, you're still allowed to go to public schools. So it would be more higher educated people. <laughs> Typically, that's what we tied in with mm -hmm. that report or mm -hmm. other means mm -hmm. of academia. Yeah. Who mm -hmm. would be more likely to not vaccinate mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But again, I, I, you know, Franklin County just kind of throws me off here with Amherst and Northampton. I would have figured that, but yeah, not so much in Franklin County. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. So <clears throat> some of the diseases of concern here. Oh, one more thing. So mm -hmm. is there any connection if they've tied at all the high rate of um, unvaccinated to higher incidences of, of any of these diseases? Absolutely. Oh. And the resurgence, the reemergence of diseases, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So things that we're concerned about here in Hampshire County and, and Northampton are these diseases. So we have influenza, not just our, you know, your regular influenza, but we're talking about the atypical measles, mumps, pertussis, et cetera. Um, and then we have our zoonotic diseases. So influenza itself, affects 15 to 20 percent of the population every single year catch the regular flu. And again, this is a vaccine preventable disease. The State Department of Public Health now says that everybody should re be receiving their flu shot every single year. Before, it was just those who were a high-risk population, so the real young, the real old, or immune compromised or chronically ill, had chronically ill diseases. Now they're saying everyone, every single year, should get their, their vaccine. Um, influenza contributes to 36,000 deaths a year, 226,000 hospitalizations a year, 38 million missed school days, and 70 million missed work days a year here in the U.S. This is just U.S. statistics. 
and about one to three billion dollars in uh, direct costs. So that's huge. Then again, we're concerned about our atypical influenza types, our bird flu and our swine flus. Again, these don't normally affect humans. However, there have been some instances of highly pathogenic strains causing disease in humans. Again, the swine flu being closest in our memories. Um, you know, the swine flu in 2009 was considered of pandemic proportion. We had 165,000 cases and 1,200 deaths worldwide. And we were lucky. We were really, really lucky. Measles. Before the advent of the vaccine in 1963, there was about 4 million cases a year of measles. Then the MMR was introduced in 1997, and that reduced to less than 1% per every million people. So for every, yeah, for every million people, less than 1% got the measles. However, there's been an uptick in two th since, uh, since 2000. In 2010, up to 2000 and 2010, there was never more than, I think there was one year there was more, but under 50 cases about what we saw in the U.S. alone for measles. And then in 2013, here in Massachusetts, we had 189 cases of measles. And not in Massachusetts, excuse me, in the state. And then in 2014, 13, 14, excuse me, we had 288 cases of measles. Northampton was implicated. I don't know if you remember this a couple months back. Yep. We had um, a professor at Smith College who went traveling and came down with measles and exposed her students and, you know, it could have been a lot worse. Needless to say, we had to vaccinate here alone in Northampton, 47 people. In Western Mass, we had to vaccinate 600 people. And I even had to quarantine a high school student for 21 days. So if a person has had the vaccination, they're not going to get the disease or likely to Not necessarily. So if they were saying that you were born pre-1958, you were considered exposed, and you shouldn't have to get that. However, there's a caveat. If you're going to do international travel, you're going to get your traveler's immunizations, and that would be one of them. Or if you were potentially exposed, you would want to get a booster. You can always have your titers checked to see if you um, you have the immunity within your body. Mm -hmm. But most people born between 1958 and, and prior were considered exposed and have immunity. Also received the, the vaccine, right? Not prior to 58, after 58. After 58, mm -hmm. most mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. did get the vaccine. But they're saying that you should receive a booster. Did you guys get a vaccine for, for measles? No. Okay, we got measles instead. Oh. <laughs> You're vaccinated. You're vaccinated. Right. Yeah, I'm vaccinated. How was that? I did it the old fashioned way too. You yeah. too? I mean, moms way back. They used to have to right. right. yeah, exactly. yeah. When yeah. I was growing up, we had pox parties. As soon right. as our That's parents gave someone had had the chicken yeah. pox, yeah. and all the kids would go over and bring 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 over so um, we had to write an official letter saying that they needed to be restricted to, you know, confined to wherever they are, their home, or if, um, if it was a student who lived here at Smith College, we would have made accommodations for them. So this, this high school student, she was a senior, couldn't go to school, couldn't work, couldn't hang out with her friends for 21 days. She didn't have um, any vaccines due to a religious exemption. And by the time we got a hold of her and figured out she had been exposed, it was really behind. They say, you know, within 72 hours, if you were exposed, you can receive the vaccine and be considered relatively safe. We just watch you for the next 10 days. Um, but we got to her too late. And um, she, you know, she, her other siblings, three other siblings also didn't have the vaccine, but they did receive the vaccine um, in, time. in time. So, yeah, she missed three weeks and you know, quarantined to her house. So mm -hmm. she wasn't happy. Her parents weren't happy, but there was nothing we could do. Mm -hmm. so. Um, so that's the measles. And then the mumps, um, let's see, in the past decade, there have been 80 cases of mumps in the U.S. However, 60% of those cases just happened last year. So again, we see, we see the uptick. 
pertussis. Um, since 2004, there's been an uptick in cases. In 2010, there was an outbreak in California. There was about 500 young children implicated, and 10 of them died in 2010. In 2012, we had more cases that year than we had ever since 1955, since the vaccine came out. And in 2013, guess what? We had an outbreak here in Northampton, in our Northampton High School. 47 confirmed cases of pertussis. Mm -hmm. That was huge. Pertussis is uh, whooping cough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yep. yep. 47 confirmed cases. That was is, a mess. Is there systematic immunization for that? Or, I mean, how did somebody slip by locally? That doesn't sound like people abstaining from vaccines so, for religious purposes or anything. Then. So, pertussis, you get a series of shots. So, you get it. Um, first year, age five, and then you should receive another booster right before you go to college, you know, it kind of wanes off in your later teens. And the story that I have it is we had some international travel among the high school students, and then they came back and um, they shared a mouth guard. So someone picked it up whose immunity had waned, um, picked up pertussis overseas, and then the lacrosse team shared a mouth guard. I don't know why anyone would share a mouth guard, but this is how it, it uh, trans got transmitted through the high school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and some of them were uh, secondary and tertiary cases too, so now you're talking about someone in the high school who, who uh, then gave it to their younger siblings or what have you. But were they already immune compromised? I mean, these are people we assume had that five-year-old vaccine. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Okay. But they they had already yep. got to wane by yep. that late teens. Mm -hmm. okay. But you, you have Hep C up there, and that's a newer disease. Yeah, yeah. late eighties. Mm -hmm. But that's that's IV transmitted in some cases. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you have yeah. a, a and B that you can do um, prophylactic. Uh, uh, measures that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And now there's something new for it, Hep C though, but that can prevent it, but not, there's not a lot of help after. After the fact, no, right, exactly. So, yes, if you get it, you can't do anything after where the A and B you can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Meaning you have it forever once you get yep. that. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then neurovirus, that is um, typically, we, we call that a foodborne illness. Um, with neurovirus here alone in the U.S., there's about 40 million cases that's transmitted through food. So this is another one that we're watching. Neurovirus really um, isn't, doesn't have a high mortality or morbidity rate. Um, it really affects those who are immune compromised or the real, the elderly. Um, most of us can wear off the neurovirus and we just think we have a stomach ache, but it spreads like wildfire. And this is one of those that's extremely virulent. One pathogenic neurovirus can live on an inanimate object up to 90 days. So you pick it up with your fingers, you, you know, eat an apple, find your apple, you ingest it, and then it starts replicating and taking over those, your good cells, turning them into bad cells, and within about 12 to 18 hours, you're sick. And it hits you like a brick wall. There's no like, oh, I'm feeling ill, feeling ill, and it just hits you. So, Needless to say, and then we have our zoonotic ones. We have Triple E, which I think I've talked to you about at a, a earlier presentation. West Nile virus, um, dengue fever is hitting the U.S. Yeah, I, that one's kind of that blows me away. <laughs> you have dengue fever, which uh, and so it's representing. Is it in this state? It's it? established. It's not. I don't believe it's established in this state. However, um, when I was doing our mosquito surveillance project last year, I came across a mosquito that they said, no way, no how, is here in this part of Massachusetts. And the state lab confirmed it, that it was this mosquito, the Asian tiger species, and this mosquito can, is a vector for many different um, viruses, okay. dengue being one of them. Malaria. Yeah, like malaria. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you this found is, one here. We found one here. Yep, off a of tip. Who was it? James called me. I can't remember. James Laura from the Water Laurel. 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 Yep. Um, I think it was him. He called me up and he was telling me that he's, you know, he's pretty sure that he's got these mosquitoes and they're huge. And these are daytime mosquitoes. They're not the ones that would say, boy, dust to dawn. Um, 
And we went out and we, we set a trap there. And where was it? It was down by the um, on route. Do you know where to keep the towers by uh, the tires on a. Uh, oh, by the 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 salvage yard. Yes, 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 yes. What is that? Uh, um, route. Route five. Yeah, route five. Thank you. Sorry, so by the connector. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Put in the tires. In the tires. Yeah. Okay. So we don't think they're established. Maybe it was brought in. We're not sure, but um, it's scary enough that. You know, it was here and we found one. Could, could mm -hmm. have something mm -hmm. and then if it were in the vehicle, the yep. tire just ended up. Mm -hmm. But Dengue, um, Dengue is carried by the Aedes Acetes, and they are absolutely 100% established in Florida, Texas. They now house themselves there. They breed there. They make a happy life there. Where before, you know, they came from Africa, and occasionally they get as far east as uh, uh, Puerto Rico or something like that when the uh, easterly winds would die down, but yeah, they're now breeding so here. So it's more to do with warming as opposed to, and trend, we have lots of new species that moving mm -hmm. north where they wouldn't mm -hmm. normally propagate and yeah, that's pretty really disconcerting actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. And, and then line. Lime course and surging. And I mean, it, it, surging, and it's completely underreported. Um, well, it's because the diagnosis is so, still so complicated, right? Very complicated, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So. And there's we don't have a vaccine for that. No. Mm -mm. And there's lots of co-infections. The, 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 the veterinarians give a vaccine to the dogs mm -hmm. and cats, so mm -hmm. there just isn't something similar for And right, and the same with the large mammals, we have the horses that can get the vaccine for triple E, but right. we can't. Oh, so. I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's out of my road. That's for that's we get wrapping opposable thumbs and power. <laughs> <laughs> you lose. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot to be concerned about. And this summer we're doing a, a tick project. We're gonna do some demographic studies. Um, we're gonna work with the lab over at UMass yeah. to see what the carriage rate is of certain diseases. Um, so it'll be fascinating. And we're also gonna work with the Hampshire County Physicians and Cooley Dickinson Hospital to talk about reporting because again, we believe that it's hugely underreported. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what it is we have to look at. We have to look at like incident, like uh, excuse me, line, like cases, or what needs to be done. I have to. We have to dig further into that. But yeah, it's be tough to chart. Yeah. I think. I do too, but it'll be yeah. I think it's we have to. It's the worthwhile Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the uh, UMass lab will test anybody's. Yes. So right, exactly. If you have a tick on you, you can send the tick in, and for fifty dollars, they'll test uh, they'll test it for nine diseases that are prevalent in this area. Um, but what we're going to be doing is we're going to go out to well, first we're going to assess where we want to do our studies, um, and then we'll be sending in whatever we collect our samples for that day, sending them over to get a carriage rate. So they're going to be testing a lot of them for us, which is fascinating. It'll be great be interesting to see what this we come up with but we're going to kind of look at trailheads the recreation areas where there's a lot of use and etc so we're just starting that anyway so the role of public health um, surveillance and early response obviously surveillance is huge so every single day, the first thing that I do when I walk into my office is I um, go to MAVEN, which is a Massachusetts software program that's done for surveillance. It'll tell me in my community what's come up and what we need to do about it. Certain diseases, you have to act within 12 hours, 24 hours, and it kind of gives you guidelines on what needs to be done. So surveillance is huge. But I'm not only watching what's going on here in Northampton, I'm watching what's going on countywide, Western Mass-wide, and I even go on to the World Health Organization site weekly. So you have to keep your eyes open. You need to know what's going on. You need to do an assessment of the health status risks, what's available in terms of services to the community. You need to develop policy. Um, we do laboratory identification. This is done at this date in Jamaica Plain, but you know we send samples there. Not only us, the health department, the local health department, but also 
all of the providers if they're um, if they need some identification because they think that they have a communicable disease that goes through through the lab. So what happens when I just step back a little bit when we when I talk about Maven is by law all of the physicians and labs are mandated to report to the State Department of Public Health if there's confirmation or a positive um, communicable disease. And there's a list of these diseases which are called reportables. So if they have someone who is presenting but there isn't a confirmed lab yet, they'll go and report it in through MAVEN and they'll put it in as suspect or probable. And then MAVEN triages it to the community that the person resides in. And so that's what I mean when I go on to Maven every single morning. I want to see what's going on in my community. And um, so that's the surveillance system that's done. Uh, what else does the health department do? Well, we need to communicate. We need to communicate with the medical providers, the hospitals, the media, getting the information out there without creating any type of mass hysteria is very, very important. But you need to tell the people, you know, what precautions that need to be taken. It's like what we did with the um, arbovirus last year. We had um, confirmed triple E. And I needed to get the message out, you know, minimize the risk by protecting yourself by wearing PPEs, try to limit your activities after, you know, dusk. There's all sorts of stuff that you can do in terms of community education without creating mass hysteria. But again, making it known that, that this is important. So, rapid communication is very, very important. Um, and then enviro environmental assessment and remediation. And it, that is huge, and that's kind of like our inspectional service department. Today we were looking for rat runs, um, you know, looking for rat habitation, sources of food and filth, that, any type of entrapment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm living the dream, guys, living the dream. <laughs> They've been flushed out, though, in that morning's neighborhood. What's that? Well, the tunnels. I mean, you can, so you're looking for, for example, their tunneling system. They tunnel, and yet yeah, uh, rat runs are also, we call rat runs, they leave like, they run the perimeters of, of buildings, dwellings, and they leave like this grease type of marking on the perimeters of buildings, so we look oh. for that in addition to feces and were you finding that sort of stuff in your walks around this morning? Yes we were. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. There was a big one that lived down here for a long time. It was elected. <laughs> it was it, it, right, really in the stone wall. Really? Of this place. Uh -huh. it was a big one. I haven't seen it in a while. <laughs> Those river rats get huge. I mean yeah. they're yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, I was very happy living down here. <laughs> So anyways, um, yes, there's all sorts of stuff that we do when we're doing our, environment, our environmental assessment and remediation just from your, your basic uh, food service inspections and what have you, Title V. So speaking of rats, though, just because um, they've been often pointed to as the source of many of these infectious diseases, bubonic plague. Mm -hmm. So is that a myth? Is there, there's been new research about that. Is it... So, is it that the rats had the disease? And it's they the were flea being... on the rat. Mm -hmm. So the flea was the carrier, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. the rat had the... They, they and... carry it inherently to... Right, so the it's rat. inherent to them. It doesn't make them sick or what have you. And then the, the flea. flea is the vector and then it bites the human. Okay. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. so the That's the mode of the transmission. The uh, From the deer mm -hmm. to the human. Mm -hmm. yeah. Deer mm -hmm. um, Bacterial infections, MRSA? Things like that. I mean, this is that's a different sphere. You can't, but I, I would imagine that that you're also you're on top of that. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The person usually it. sets up in hospital situations, and, um, and I don't know how that is these days around here. But that's pretty pernicious with C fit and things like mm -hmm. that. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, these opportunistic bacterial infections that set in and do in the uh, immune compromised people. Mm -hmm. We actually have a large population of immunosuppressed people here, and for for we have the VA hospital, mm -hmm. and the, the hospital system, um, and then a lot of people aging. But mm -hmm. also uh, there's there's a substantial HIV community, mm -hmm. which is also immune mm -hmm. compromised. So there's there's 
That's one thing that's uh, on my immediate future. I was talking to John Davin, who is our emergency manager right now, and we need to get a better handle on our population. And, you know, when we talk to the VA, we want to know how many residents they have, how many are disabled, how many... We don't have those numbers, and people aren't forthcoming with them either, so we're going to try to get a meeting um, with all of the stakeholders involved to try to get a better understanding on our population here and what we're dealing with. And there's significant turnover there, too, mm -hmm. and, it's in, and it's not isolated, regionally isolated. People come from all over the country mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for services here. So right. And then are right. introduced into the community. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, we're seeing a larger immigrant population now. Um, and we want to make sure that they're getting vaccines. We've done more vaccines in the past six months than I've, I've been here almost two years now um, with the immigrant population. We have kids in school and they don't have primary care providers yet. And you don't want to turn them away from school. So we call up our community partners, the State Department, to see what they have for vaccines because we don't have a rolling vaccine program here yet um, to see what we can do to help How's this the population. How's funding out. for... Uh vaccine programs. I mean, you, yeah. I mean, you, I would imagine that this is all very expensive and that, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. But uh, when I first came here, I asked to open up a revolving account. Right. Um, and that's helping subsidize it at this point. Mm -hmm. and you know, we just did TB uh, skin test for the fire department today and that we have to buy those and they're very expensive and... Are you finding resurgence of TB? Of tuberculosis too? There is, not here in our community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And polio? Not in the U.S. yet. Okay. Yep. yep. What prompted the testing of the fire department then? I'm not sure how far back that goes, but I believe in their contract it states something about getting um, inoculated for certain things being okay. at risk, hypoxia. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. And the health department has just historically provided it to them. And it's just um, a great service, and it you know keeps us. And some places, just as a matter of course, like for example, university, anyone applying for a job, mm -hmm. have, or once you've been offered a job, you have to have a TB test. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah. So we're looking to grow this program, and we're now um, we contract with UMass to do our billing, so we're getting a good. That we can't get reimbursed for the vaccine itself that's provided through the state, um, but we can get a portion of the administration fees back. And then being part of this billing system, uh, some of the vaccines that we actually purchase through private companies, we can get a portion of that money back too. So, so we're working on it anyways. So, infectious disease in the future, you know, success in reducing morbidity and mortality from infectious diseases during the first three quarters of the 20th century led to complacency about the needs for continued research into the treatment and control of infectious microbes. However, with the, appear um, the appearance of AIDS and the reemergence of TB, oh, is it going out? <laughs> um, <laughs> There's been an overall increase of infectious disease mortality during the 80s and the 90s, and now we're seeing a huge surge in 2000. So with the emergence of new disease and reemergence of other diseases, this is, underscores the importance of disease prevention through continual monitoring, watching underlying factors, looking at trends, and just being diligent and hopefully learning from what we are learning today about these reemergence and new diseases and what we've learned in the past and doing it better. So it is a huge job and in all of my years of public health and my schooling, I never, ever, ever thought I would see measles. Physicians in the community were looking to me to tell them what to look for because they've never seen measles. So it's a very scary thing and we just we need to work as a community, as a whole and do community outreach and education and promote vaccination. Again, it's the best. How would you advise a family then that might have um, that might have uh, children, families that have children that weren't vaccinated for measles at this point, and maybe they're, you know, and right, right. So what, sure. how would you advise them at this point? So I've been talking with Karen Jarvis Vance about this because it is a very touchy subject. Um, I think, you know, we're, with everything that's gone on the past two years, with the pertussis outbreak 
and with the measles um, case here in Northampton, the quarantine and the high school. And as much as we tried to keep that quiet, that one high school you know, student posted it on social media and everyone knew about it and they were all running to the nurse's office to see if they were vaccinated. So I think, you know, riding on these coattails here is a very good time for us to talk about immunization, have a forum with pedi a pediatrician there, um, someone, a third party specialist in terms of vaccination. Karen, public health represented, have all these people represented in talking about the vaccine and the safety of them and what they can do and what we've seen here in our community and what we're looking at on a broader spectrum. Um, talking and those, about and those children who haven't been vaccinated still get vaccinated at this they point? They can, absolutely. And then the other audience we were thinking about targeting is those going to college because they're going to be 18 years old and they now can make a decision for themselves and whether or not they want to receive the vaccine. So we're working on, on doing a lot. The, this is actually building on something that Councilor Adams is asking them to uh, relative to your um, quarantining someone. Mm -hmm. What legal authority do you have? Do you have the legal authority yes, to mm -hmm. impose quarantine sure on do. individuals who are not vaccinated and exposed? Not that, yes, absolutely. Not vaccinated and exposed. Mm -hmm. And the quarantines, for all practical intents and purposes, is an imprisonment. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's mm -hmm. a restricting them. It's restricting them, freedom. right. We like to use the word restriction. <laughs> restriction, yes. <yeah. laughs> well, I, I, I imagine, but, but I mean, it's virtually the same. It's house arrest. It you is. Can't, you can't go, in fact, it's even Nowhere. more than house arrest because you can't actually have people visit you. Yep. Mm -hmm. You're isolated. Mm -hmm. and, and so what, what, if you, what if a person violates that? Well, I mean, we have the authority for enforcement also, and we would get the police involved if we had to. So after we quarantined the high school student, we told her she couldn't go to school, and she's restricted from the public and what have you, and people couldn't go to her house. Um, we get a call the, the next day asking, you know, well, she works, and she needs to go to work, and I had to explain again what restriction was and no contact with the public. And so, again, it's just educating educating people on, on um, the adverse effects, what could happen if they were to expose a population. No, it's for somebody who had not been vaccinated. Had not been vaccinated. Okay. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so if, if, but if, if you had the information that you were exposed but had been vaccinated, then you wouldn't impose the court. Right. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. Right. And so her other siblings, her parents, their parents decided to vaccinate them. So that they wouldn't all be mm -hmm. quarantined. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. She would have been better off getting the measles because then she could have left the house 10 days after right, instead right. of the 21 she days. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. right. But right, you know, so we do keep, you know, in this case, this is the first time I've ever had to quarantine anyone um, besides an animal. Um, you know, we relied on, on the parents and we talked to them every single day asking, you know, how she feeling. We wanted to make sure she presented with anything. Um, we wanted to be right there with her. But again, it was just educating them. What would have we done had they, you know, if we knew that they were breaking the quarantine, we probably would have had to get the police involved. Did, now, did you find out after the fact, um, was this a deliberate decision by the parents some 15 years ago not to vaccinate their children for, for measles? They said it was a religious exemption. A and religious? it was it's not just measles, it's a plethora of vaccines. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. okay. But, you know, as soon as they found out that she was exposed, they got the other two children vaccinated. Which is good. That's what we want in, in the end anyways, is the vaccination. So, whether that religious exemption just went out the window, because I do know people who are of certain faith would never take the vaccine if it was a true religious exemption. So, again, a lot of people are just using this as they're out for another reason. Mm -hmm. Well, it should prove as an added incentive, possible you know, suspension of your civil rights in the event that you, you opt not to have the vaccine and mm -hmm. you're exposed. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would imagine that that would hopefully figure in people's calculus to determining whether to forego vaccination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So this individual, though, now is still at risk of being, is still at risk of contracting measles. Um, Absolutely. I'm hoping that the parents vaccinated oh, after the fact. Oh, we don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And is she almost 18 herself? Yeah. Or, mm -hmm. Okay, so she could decide then if she yeah. wanted to. Yeah. And, and so just out of curiosity for those that do choose for, you know, ostensibly religious reasons, but it may be another reason, what is the fear then? I know we, you talked about the connection with autism, but is there something else that, that may drive? Well, I mean, we have we have this population that's anti-government. We have this population that's anti-science. You know, they're organic, um, and then medical. Outside of that, I don't know what the driving factors could be. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, did anyone here want to offer anything? Of what it, they heard? Uh, there, there was and still is anti-vaccination um, ethos among people who believe. Actually, as Meredith mentioned, that that in a foreign introduction of any any virus into a system is one not good for you, inorganic, and also the the government suspicion thing. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people. There are collections of people who um, have have a resistance to any government program, fluoridation of water, for instance, fluoridation of water, for that matter, and all those things. Um, they have. You know, an ethical resistance to it. There, and this is where this this battle comes down: whether someone's cultural resistance to something because mm -hmm. it's bad. When you're talking about something that's for the greater good, and if you're talking about 95 percent reduction of of, of uh, child threatening diseases, I would say the greater good has been demonstrated. But it's, I mean, you know, you have you have inalienable rights to not be injected by your government. <laughs> yes, no, I, I, I can understand, you know, I guess what I'm more curious about and whether there's enough data out there is the claim that the vaccine, because it is, you're introducing the very virus itself, so mm -hmm. is there the fear that should you be vaccinated absolutely. with one of those, Even you will with, in fact contract that mm -hmm. disease, and so that's Even the Even with the flu, and we see it all the time, you right. hear people saying, I got the flu from the flu shot, right. in fact, they didn't get the flu from the flu right. shot, so there is that fear, and again, it's all about educating them that, you know, there are some vaccines that you are more right. at risk to actually getting a lesser, milder version of that disease shingles being one of them um now i've heard the shingles is the absolute pits painful can last for I years i got mine oh the shingles i got my shingles vaccination and manifested actually some some slight pox marks and uh -huh. so but dude, i'm better off not absolutely shingles. absolutely shingles is, is debilitating mm -hmm. and excruciating mm -hmm. so. so that is a vaccine a person can get is a shingles yeah, then you should get it over the age of 62, I believe oh. it is. They recommend it. Um, so, but there are some of those uh, vaccines that can actually give you a, a milder version of the disease. Well, there, and it, it, there are, I mean, to be fair, there are people who have adverse reactions to mm -hmm. bad vaccines. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, on the, in the grand sweep of things, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, but when people are thinking about making their individual health choices, some um, are informed by suspicion, fear, um, any other things, right. and or what their friend told them happened to them, or something like that. So it's it's an uphill battle. The fact that you have the success rate that you do was actually kind of mm -hmm. heartening, given yeah. given you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. They say for for uh, for vaccine preventable diseases in children. The vaccines ward off 4.1 infectious diseases per child. So that's a lot, a lot yes. of disease. Last year for vaccine preventable uh, diseases for children, it was 120,000 um, diseases in the U.S. That it. Um, I'm trying to. Re I'm trying to remember what the statistic was, but it ended up where um, 11. Let me see. No, 1,500, excuse me, almost 1,500 children died last year in the U.S. alone from these BP, uh, D, the BPD, vaccine preventable diseases that could have been prevented. And it was like 150,000 got sick. So, I mean, there, the numbers are huge. I mean, the science and the data are there. But there were no links to autism last year. I mean, so if you look at the, the bigger picture. Right. Mm -hmm. The the other irony is that the the whole autism scare took off on the internet, viral on the internet. So an internet viral infection mm -hmm. literally mm -hmm. manifested 
as the, the, the experience that Meredith's describing now with an uptick of infectious diseases because people terrified based on what they saw online. Mm -hmm. That went epically viral. When did that scare, when was that connection claimed that Andrew Whitehead, he was. was in the late 80s. Okay, so mm -hmm. that's been around for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it didn't really take off until, I mean, it, well, part of the things that informed it was they changed the diagnosis for autism, for one thing. They mm -hmm. broadened the spectrum yes. vastly. Yes. So consequently, the diagnosis of autism increased exponentially. Right. And then everyone was trying to find a root cause. And, and they and found it jived, it jived with yep. uh, Jenny McCarthy's kind of, and, and Michelle Bachman, I believe, mm -hmm. also alluded to mm -hmm. it too. And uh, uh, you know, he, and it actually figured in a in a debate at the Republican debate, where unfortunately a lot of people received information where they actually look at his gospel. So then it, it you know, and the internet and social media literally helped propagate this this kind of attitude. But it's not unique to this; it's any number right. of things, but. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you know, it goes from the benign watching kittens do silly things to actually having people make irrational decisions mm -hmm. that actually affect the health of everybody. Yeah, that's so true. So, so for people who are uh, interested in getting the flu vaccine, um, and they may be otherwise either cost prohibitive or something else through their uh, regular insurance provider, mm -hmm. would they just contact your office mm -hmm. and come yep. there? Are, we, yep, yep, we okay. hold clinics. We probably hold about 30 clinics during the season. You know, it depends on the availability of the vaccine and how much we get, but on average, that's what we're doing. And again, we're targeting, we're honing in on the uninsured and the underinsured and the high-risk populations. Mm -hmm. So you'll be taking your mobile unit out to Sites, that's great. Mm -hmm. Are you offering everything? That you are you offering MMR and, and, and no, not yet. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep, we're gonna hopefully do uh, HPV, um, flu. There are a few things that we're trying to work out that we'd like to provide, and of course, we'll be you know mobile health education center also. Um, maybe do a little smoke and cessation. Um, yeah, very exciting. The, the trailer right now is over at Industrial Sheet Metal getting retrofitted for so it could be used um, in a better way, more efficient and effective way. But yeah, thrilled about it. Excellent. And the fire department, I mean, they have said whatever we need in terms of moving the trailer and doing clinics, they, they're more than happy to, to assist with this. So. And then the other reference to the rodents or things like that, people, if they did notice, um, you know, the uh, influx of those or a lot of signs, like you said, that line of grease or mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. they should contact your office, mm -hmm, although they may mm -hmm. have to um, seek a professional for it. That's usually what needs to happen. However, they try, a lot of people try to remediate themselves before seeking a professional. It just, it seems to uh, make matters worse which is unfortunate, um, but right, so right now we're doing an assessment of the entire neighborhood to try to figure out the source. Things that we have to look at is that was there any um, clearing of land or reuse of land, um, you know, when we're talking about the river, we now, we're dealing with snow melt, we're dealing with rain, so the river's high and it's pushing them out and upward into the community. You're and looking in that particular neighborhood. Mm -hmm. This is what we're doing right now. This is what we've been doing all day today. Mm -hmm. And then we want to look at harborage. I mean, simple brush piles. They love making nests underneath there. Sources of food, sources of water, sources of fill. So it's really, um, it's multi-layered. It's not just seeing evidence of rats. It's, again, trying to determine the source. And again, we can't get rid of them. It's up to the, the homeowners to have to take care of the problems. But we can cite if there's obvious uh, violations that or an attractant thereof, which is drawing them in. Mm -hmm. Or if they happen to be inhabitants of the sewer system, mm -hmm. you know, something mm -hmm. the city would need to. Mm -hmm. Right, um, right. Change. Yeah. Okay. So. Or, or council changes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, thank you very much.
very much. Does anybody else have any questions for Meredith? No, you just, your mosquitoes have scared the bejesus out of me, but thank you. As they important. should, yeah. yeah. Would you um, be willing to send us this PowerPoint oh, presentation? Oh, absolutely. We'd mm -hmm. attach that. If you could send it to mm -hmm. Pam, then we'd we'll be attached mm -hmm. to the minutes for, for future reference. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I talked to you during that whole surveillance program or after the fact, but it is very clear that the mosquitoes that carry the triple E virus, which is the deadly virus, has a 30 to 50 percent mortality rate, have established themselves here in western Massachusetts. So they're breeding, this is their home now, where before, if there was a positive mosquito, it was by chance, right? Something brought it over or someone who was confirmed with the disease was out in the east and, now, and resides here. They're now saying that they're established here, and we need to. So that is a vaccine someone could get. If they're no, no. So, no, so there's no, there's no nothing for the triple. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's mm -hmm. right. So there's the vaccine. Mm -hmm. The yeah. Mm -hmm. The yeah was that determined last year? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I yeah. thought that the at sure. that point there were no longer it was not a phenomenon anymore. Discovering mm -hmm. rare odd. Mm -hmm. So for that we recommend repellent. Just Repellent, dust, changing stay, your behavior, stay out. You know, I find stay. myself yeah. sometimes like <laughs> in a pickle between things because, you know, on one hand I'm telling people to limit their activities, you know, after dusk, and the other hand I'm telling them to get out and get moving to combat obesity. So it's very conflicting sometimes the messages that I'm trying to get out. But yeah, again. I'm not saying it's an end all and put your children or yourselves in a bubble after a death, but if you're going to go out and you have to be at an event, definitely wear protective clothing. There are all sorts of sort of repellents. Um, there's not, yeah, lots of things that you can do, but you just you know getting that information out there is really really important. So, and I think we're going to be following you know what they do out east a lot. I mean, they limit their um, their municipal activities ending before, you know, half an hour before dusk, and that's just the way of life now, and I think that will have to end up here at some point. The sad thing is, is there's no testing, or hasn't been testing in 10 years outside of our program that we did last year, and the two horses that died were um, less than a mile from our track site. Belcher Town. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And mosquitoes have a two-mile radius, homing radius. So, it makes sense. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you for all that you're doing. All right. My Thanks pleasure. for your report. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Okay. And if there's anything that you want me to report on, instead of me just coming up with these presentations, I'd be more than happy to. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'll ask if there's any other business to come before the... I'll move that we adjourn. Second. Right. Moved and seconded to adjourn. Undebatable. All those in favor? Aye. Okay, we are adjourned now.